Hello, I'd like to uh, welcome you all. My name is Ute Wartenberg. I'm the executive director, director of, of the American, American Numismatic Society. I'm particularly pleased that we have um, quite a few new faces here from um, the usual crowd. Um, this is the um, Harry W. Fowler Memorial Lecture. Um, and um, as this is a subject that would have been of interest um, to Harry Fowler, uh, this is particularly appropriate. He was a collector primarily of Bactrian coins at a time when um, this wasn't all uh, that common. I, I mentioned that earlier uh, today. And he left his uh, very sizable collection uh, to the American Numismatic Society. And in fact, that was um, turned by Osman Boparacci into our last um, Sulugi volumes. It was still considered Greek, um, this area. But um, Harry Fowler was also the um, president of the American Numismatic Society. He was a very generous donor and an amazing um, fundraiser. And um, that was something we therefore very pleased to have this memorial lecture. Um, we are extremely pleased to have um, Professor Wagner um, here with our very interesting topic that he's going to, and he's going to be introduced by um, Vivek Gupta. I'm particularly pleased, and I'd like to acknowledge um, Vivek's extremely hard work for this lecture, but just even opening this uh, field up. And um, I'd like to say he's here, um, unfortunately, just for this year, and this is really because of lack of funding, and we're trying to increase um, our endowments in that area, which, as you know, um, focus mainly in the ancient areas because people, donors, come there. But really, um, things are only going to improve if we build in this area. So we, we or we, this is the royal we, I've taken a step when Vivek came along and thought, you know, this is a great person and let's just take a step and have someone here for the year, even though we didn't have funding for it, you know. Um, and I'm extremely pleased this has happened and I hope um, that this will continue in some shape or form. So I will now hand over to him and um, I hope you enjoy the lecture. Okay, so thank you, Uta. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to the 2017 Harry Fowler Memorial Lecture. First, I would like to thank Uta, um, the director of the ANS, for her support this past year. Um, and having the focus of the Fowler Lecture be on Islamic and South Asian coinage. Tonight we will hear from Philip Wagner, professor of art history and archaeology at Wesleyan University, whose lecture will be followed by a response from Finn Barbary Flood, the William R. Keenan Jr., professor of the humanities at the Institute of Fine Arts and College of Arts and Sciences at NYU. Philip Wagner received his BA from Kenyon College and his PhD from the University of Wisconsin. His research focuses on the cultural history of the Deccan region of South India. Let's go back one slide. Um, so there's a map up there for you to see where that is located. Um, primarily in the late medieval and early modern periods. His primary interest is in the historical interactions between the region's established Indic culture and the Persian culture that arrived when the Delhi Sultanate annexed the region in the early 14th century. To study the dynamics of this process, he relies on a broad range of literary, epigraphic, architectural, and archaeological evidence gathered over the course of numerous trips to the field since the early 1980s. Since 1987, he has been associated with the Vijayanagar Research Project, an international team of scholars in different disciplines dedicated to documentation and interpretation of the site of Vijayanagar, capital of the state that dominated the southern part of the Indian Peninsula between the 1340s and 1565. And you'll see it at the bottom of the peninsula there. Over the years, Wagner has trained numerous historians of art and architecture. His publications truly have been groundbreaking and have inspired several scholars, his respondent, <coughs> Finbar Barry Flood, among them. For example, Wagner's 1996 article, Sultan Amongst Hindu Kings, Dress, Titles, and, in, and Islamization of Hindu Culture at Vijayanagar, concluded that the royal, court, the royal imagery projected by Vijayanagar's rulers through Islamicized styles of dress and address were far more complex than the simple image in which the communally inspired historiography of our own age has cast them. Published in 2009, 
Finbar Barry Flood's Objects of Translation, Material Culture, and Medieval Hindu-Muslim Encounter, a book familiar to many of us, similarly took up the issue of cultural cross-dressing and demonstrated the phenomenon identified by Wagner in an early, earlier period in the Hindu and Buddhist kingdoms of Northern India. For many of us, Wagner's 1999 article, Fortuitous Convergences and Essential Ambiguities, Transcultural Political Elites in the, in the Medieval Deccan, has been invaluable for providing a model to think, about, think with when understanding the lives of historical figures who could switch between a number of cultural codes and cross-cultural boundaries. Most recently, Wagner completed a book co-authored with historian Richard Eaton entitled Power Memory Architecture, Contested Sites on India's Deccan Plateau, 1300 to 1600. Instead of focusing on imperial centers, power memory and architecture looks at important frontiers and sites of contact and exchange between Vijayanagar and the De Deccan Sultanates. The collaborative book has been met with numerous workshops and even an edited volume, uh, Reuse of the Past, Producing the Deccan, 1300 to 1700, edited by Ajay Rao. And Power, Memory, and Architecture is also the recipient of the Association of Asian Studies Anand Kentesh Kumar Swami's book, book Prize and the American Historical Association's John F. Richards Prize in South Asian History. Tonight's lecture is entitled The Deccan as an Integrated Currency Zone, New Approaches to the Study of Peninsular Indian Coin Hordes. 1347 to 1687. Its application of spatial and statistical methods to the analysis of Deccan coin hoards suggests that the region should be considered an integrate, a single integrated uh, currency zone, and that neither of its constituent coinages can be fully understood except in light of the other. These findings have far-reaching implications for the broader cultural history of this major Indian region. With that, please join me in welcoming Philip Wagner. Well, thank you. Uh, that was a, a very uh, undeservedly generous introduction. And I'd like to say how pleased I am to be here at the American Numismatic Society uh, and how deeply honored I am to have been asked to give the Fowler Memorial Lecture. I'd also like to uh, say that I'm really happy to see a bunch of friends uh, from long time ago in the audience and also some newer friends. Uh, in particular, I'd like to single out uh, John Fritz, who's sitting over there, who I consider my ultimate guru and mentor on things Vijayanagara. Uh, 1987 was the first season that I spent working with the Vijayanagara project. And also on the more recent end, Pankaj Tandon sitting here uh, with whom I was collaborating uh, last year on another numismatic project that I'm not going to talk about tonight but uh, could possibly uh, mention a little bit uh, in the discussion. Uh, and uh, that's been also uh, very wonderful and, and fruitful uh, as a collaboration. Now, one thing I'd like you to have noticed, uh, I would hope that you had noticed in Vivek's um, kind of summary of my, my oeuvre, there was no, no mention whatsoever of the word coin or numismatics uh, or uh, monetary history or anything like that. And so I want to go to great pains to make it clear that I am a very recent interloper in this field, even though I had the good fortune as I was uh, chatting with Michael Bates earlier this evening, um, to have studied with A.K. Narayan of Indo-Greek coin fame. And uh, that year uh, in our class in graduate school, there was also uh, Bill Spengler, who will be known to many of you. Uh, and we were able to study numismatics from the original objects from uh, Bill's collection. So anyway, what I'd like to say is please uh, feel free to call attention to any horrible gaffes or blunders or questions uh, of uh, interpretation that I may make. I hope that uh, at least the bare skeletal framework of what I will present 
uh, holds, though. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of uh, contextualization to, to build on what Vivek had, had done. Um, this project uh, that I'm going to be talking about tonight is one that I began uh, about four years ago after having finished that book that you saw on the right-hand side. Uh, and it was uh, in production, I needed something to do. And so I, never mind why, um, thought that uh, writing a history of money use in the Deccan would be a worthwhile endeavor. And I will explain later, you know, why I got that idea. Um, but um, the basic questions that I'm addressing in this project are trying to understand not what the policy was in terms of minting different coins, defining them typologically, and uh, uh, coming up with a, a kind of monetary policy on the part of the state, but rather what happened at the level of the market when the coins were set out into circulation, and what people did with them, how they used them, and so on. These are the kinds of questions uh, that I've set about to asking myself. Now, inevitably, given the context of the Deccan, uh, which you have seen in that first image of the map, is bifurcated into a Islamic uh, Persianate northern half and a Hindu Sanskritic southern half, um, inevitably, it's hard to get beyond that kind of uh, historiographic construction. One has to work very uh, uh, assiduously to, to move beyond those kinds of false dichotomies that have been imposed. So as I was working on this, one of the things that began to interest me was would the answers to the questions that I'm asking about money use, would they differ for the Bahmanis uh, from how they would be answered for the Vijayanagara people? Um, and if so, how? And so I started out working with the Bahmani aspect of things. And as I found myself having done earlier, having started with the Vijayanagara side of things, I could only have to uh, start looking at the Bahmani uh, side of the equation. And it was the very much the same thing happening here, except going in the other way. I started studying Bahmani coinage. I quickly realized that you cannot possibly understand <coughs> Bahmani coinage without also understanding Vijayanagara coinage. And so that's uh, kind of the, the theme uh, of the, the, the talk tonight. Um, I'm suffering from rather severe uh, hay fever, or spring sinuses, spring uh, 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 allergies. And so in the interest of keeping to the time limit and also keeping on track without going off on too many tangents, which I have a tendency to do, I'm going to read pretty closely to uh, prepared text here. So let me just get into uh, this map I should have put up there a minute ago, but we'll come back to it. Um, what first set me to thinking about the Deccan as an integrated currency zone was a Bahmani inscription that I encountered at Maliabad, a fortified town located some 20 kilometers south of Raichur, in the perennially unstable frontier between the Vijayanagara and Bahmani states. In investigating a small, unassuming mosque there, I encountered a Persian epigraph dated to the 21st of January, 1513, and inscribed on a slab at the front of the mosque. It records the text of a kaulnama, that is, an annual tax rate agreement entered into by the district's governor and the local rural uh, leadership. Preserved texts of such kaulnamas are quite rare in the 16th century Deccan, so this record was a matter of real interest. The inscription is unusual on several counts, but one thing appeared particularly noteworthy to me. This was that the taxes that were to be collected differed from one occupational group to the next, not only in the amounts that were to be paid, but also in the coinage in which they were assessed. Thus, cultivators, grocers, and weavers, over there uh, on the top of the, 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 the chart, on uh, the top three lines, had their uh, taxes assessed in Vijayanagara gold coins, namely the hon and its half unit, the pratapa 
while oil sellers, tailors, and landholders, together with two other occupations uh, whose names are <coughs> illegible in the inscription today, had their taxes assessed in Bahmani silver tankas. Members of two groups who followed apparently less lucrative occupations, part-time weavers and category two tailors, had their taxes assessed in jittles, the Bahmani copper unit. This assessment in various currencies raises several questions. Does the inscription imply that the Bahmani state actually accepted tax payments in Vijayanagara coins alongside its own? If so, going back to the contested zone map, uh, might that perhaps have represented an unusual but pragmatic arrangement that obtained only in the contested region of the Raichur Doab where control slipped frequently back and forth between Vijayanagara and the Bahmanis? Or might it represent a more general pattern that had obtained throughout the entire Bahmani realm? To begin to answer these questions, we may turn to the material and spatial evidence provided by coin hoards. As most of you know, these are assemblages of coins that have been buried in the ground not retrieved by their owners, and then subsequently unearthed by someone else. Hoards can be deposited either intentionally as savings, or perhaps for temporary safekeeping, or unintentionally as when someone inadvertently drops a coin pouch and fails to recover it. The importance of coin hoards for our purposes is that they yield a small sample of the currency that was in circulation at the time and the place of their deposit. When hoards remain intact and available for study, they can provide an abundance of important monetary historical information. But even if their contents have been dispersed and sold, their evidentiary value still remains high as long as a formal notice of some sort or another has been published. Such reports are routinely published by the Archaeological Survey of India in the Numismatics and Treasure Trove section of the annual Indian Archaeology Review. It was John Dayel, a pioneer in applying coin hoard analysis to the monetary history of South Asia, who first called my attention to these treasure trove reports. He suggested to me that a systematic perusal of these reports might yield a significant corpus of published reports on coin hoards unearthed in the Deccan, including such important details as their fine spots and internal composition. As an enticement, he sent me a reference to IAR 1991-92, which included a report on a hoard of 225 gold coins and 17 silver coins unearthed together in Bidar during public works digging to lay a new water main. And you see number four there in the treasure trove uh, section uh, gives the original publication text of, of the composition of that hoard. All of the silver coins and three of the gold coins were Bahmani issues, while the remaining 222 gold coins were all products of the Vijayanagara mint. The coins were also broken down by issuing ruler, permitting the inference that the hoard could have been deposited no earlier than 1435, which is the beginning of the reign of Ahmad Shah II, Bahmani ruler, whose coins account for the majority of Bahmani coins in the hoard, both gold and silver, and most likely not much later than 1457, which would have been Ahmad Shah's last date, uh, there being no coins of any other ruler later represented. If the hoard represents an unintentional loss, it would also permit us to infer that Vijayanagara gold coins issued between 1377 and 1404, the reign of Harihara II, whose coins account for some percentage of the Vijayanagara gold present in the hoard, were still in circulation in the reign, uh, I'm sorry, in the region of the Bahmani <coughs> capital in the mid 15th century, at least 50 years later when the hoard was deposited. Encouraged by the, d the richness of this treasure trove data, I proceeded to work my way systematically through all of the IRA volumes uh, published since the journal's inception in 1953-54. During this exercise, I compiled information about the composition and spatial location of any hoard from the larger Deccan region, including the states of Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, 
in Karnataka and now Telangana as well, uh, which contained material issued either by the Bahmanis and their immediate successor states or by Vijayanagara and their successors. In this way, I have assembled a corpus of 307 published hoards, together containing a total of over 100,000 coins, 104,907 to be <laughs> precise. To simplify the management and analysis of all of this data, I constructed a spatial database using ArcGIS software. Uh, since I realized that many people are not familiar uh, with GIS uh, systems, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail just to give you a sense of how this works and how uh, marvelously uh, handy it can be for numismatic research. For each hoard, the find spot has been plotted by its precise geographic coordinates and data relating to the hoard's composition has been entered into the associated attribute data table. For example, in the central map window of this present slide, you can see a cluster of black dots indicating the find spots of 11 hordes located within the city of Bidar or its immediate environs. The dot highlighted in blue shows the location of the above mentioned hoard, and the highlighted row in the table below presents its corresponding attribute data, including locational and chronological data, as well as a breakdown of the hoard's contents by issuing state and metal and so on. To the right of the screen, all of this information is presented in columnar form just for the selected hoard. That's much easier to see, although still there are some fields at the bottom of this uh, simpler uh, representation on the right side. Uh, you can probably make out, the, you know, we've got the, the name of the district and the state, the longitude, the latitude, uh, an ID number, and then the breakdown by Vijayanagara gold, Vijayanagara silver, et cetera, et cetera, including all of the many dynasties um, who, whose coins were, were found in the course of uh, carrying out this research. Um, so it's, it's quite a, uh, a wonderful way of being able to get instant statistics on any hoard uh, very quickly. So I will return to this data in a few moments, but first it will be useful to consider very, very briefly the physical characteristics of the actual money itself. We may start by recognizing that the Bahmani and the Vijayanagara coinages were in fact linked uh, in two important ways. First, they were both trimetallic in the sense that they both featured coins minted in three different metals, the standard trinity of gold, silver, and copper. Second, they were also similar in that both employed a common metrological unit, the masha in Sanskrit, even though at the Vijayanagara mint, an older val value for this unit was used, which was equivalent to 0.856 grams, while the Bahmani mint employed a newer and slightly heavier value, which worked out to 0.918 grams. In three other respects, however, the two coinages were fundamentally different. First, in the terms of their design, the Bahmani coins were aniconic, featuring nothing but Persian uh, calligraphic inscriptions on both obverse and reverse, giving the names and the titles of the ruling sultan. In contrast, the Vijayanagara coins featured on the obverse an image of a Hindu deity, or in most cases, a pair of deities, and on the reverse, the names and titles of the ruling king usually written in Sanskrit uh, and in inscribed in the Devanagari script. The second factor that separated the two coinages very significantly is their specific metrology. So even though they share the same basic unit, the intervals that they construct from that unit end up being uh, very decisively difference, uh, different. So uh, <coughs> the table here should make this clear. It shows that in contrast to the copper issues of the two coinages, seen down here at the bottom of the page, uh, which share the same denominational spectrum and even appear to exhibit a one-to-one -one correspondence in terms of their weights, there is absolutely no overlap between the weights of Bahmani and Vijayanagara denominations of gold and silver coins. For each of these two metals, the Bahmani coins occupy the upper range of the weight spectrum and the Vijayanagara the lower. Moreover, 
There are only two very heavy denominations of Bahmani gold coins, the dinar and the tanka, the larger one being just 1.17 times the size of the smaller, whereas there are as many as five different denominations of Vijayanagara gold coins, with the largest being 20 times the size of the smallest. All of this suggests that the Bahmani gold coins, given the substantial amount of gold they contain, were high value coins that would have been useful only for the highest value monetary <coughs> transactions, or in more cases probably, as a medium for storing wealth. In contrast, Vijayanagara's gold hon and its fractional denominations could be conveniently used in a broad variety of economic transactions, ranging from purchasing luxury items all the way down to relatively inexpensive foodstuffs. For example, we learn from Duarte Barbosa, a Portuguese trader writing in 1518, that imported Persian war horses, so essential to the uh, Vijayanagara military economy, could be purchased for between 250 and 375 hons each, while less expensive commodities, such as calico cloths, could be had for half a hon apiece, according to another Portuguese writer, Domingo Paes, who wrote an account in 1522. Paes also gives prices for relatively inexpensive foodstuffs that could be purchased for one fanam, or a tenth of a hon, including one rabbit or three bunches of grapes. The third point of difference between the two coinages is that their historical origins, obviously, lie in two very different directions. The Bahmani system originated as a direct adaptation of that employed by the Delhi Sultanate in northern India, which by the time it was introduced to the Deccan with Delhi's conquests of the region in the years around 1300, had already been refined through nearly a century's use in the subcontinent. In contrast to the Bahmani's imported North Indian coinage system, Vijayanagara's currency represents the end product of over 400 years of local evolution within the Deccan itself, ultimately deriving from the currency system that had been introduced by the Chalukyas of Kalyana around the middle of the 10th century. <coughs> All right, let us return now to the coin hoard database and to the questions raised by the Malayabad inscription. Did the Bahmani state's assessment of taxes in Vijayanagara currency at that site reflect simply a local arrangement, a practical response to the Raichur Doab's status as a contested borderland, or was it instead symptomatic of a much broader use of Vijayanagara coinage in the territory of the Bahmani state? If the former is the case, then we would not expect to see any significant number of hordes containing Vijayanagara coins to the north of the Krishna River, whereas if the latter is true, we should see precisely that, numerous hordes testifying to the broader circulation of Vijayanagara coinage within the Bahmani territory. But before we look at the spatial distribution of fine spots of Vijayanagara hordes, it might first be useful to establish a baseline uh, in the form of understanding the sphere within which the Bahmani's own currency circulated. The map before you plots only those 116 hordes that contain coins issued by the Bahmanis or their successors. Not surprisingly, the distribution of the fine spots suggests that the area of circulation of Bahmani coins was more or less congruent with the territory of the Bahmani state, indicated by the blue shading. The small circle with the X mark indicates the mean center of all the Bahmani fine spots, located some 75 kilometers northeast of Bidar, which was the Bahmani capital and the primary mint, while the circle inscribed around it represents in graphic form the standard distance deviation, 242 and a half kilometers, a statistical measure of the degree of dispersion of features around their mean center. All right, now let us turn and examine the data for Vijayanagara hordes. This next map plots the locations of only the 146 hordes that contain Vijayanagara material. Instead of showing a distribution of fine spots congruent with Vijayanagara's territory, this map vividly demonstrates that there are in fact more hordes 
containing Vijayanagara material located outside the boundaries of Vijayanagara territory than inside, with the bulk of these concentrated in Bahmani territory. As a result, the mean center of Vijayanagara fine spots is displaced over 177 kilometers to the north of the Vijayanagara capital and primary mint, so that it falls well outside Vijayanagara territory and the standard distance deviation, 293.6 kilometers, is significantly greater than was the case with the Bahmani horde distribution. Of course, the virtue here is that we can compare uh, statistically, numerically, uh, distributions and have a, a quantifiable uh, result rather than just having to uh, rely on the image produced by a map or our, our sense of it. Uh, what this map does not communicate is a sense of the sheer volume of Vijayanagara gold hones that were circulating within the Bahmani realm. Of the 146 hordes that contained Vijayanagara material, 83 were found within Bahmani territory, and in all but four of them, the Vijayanagara material consists of nothing but gold hones and their fractions. There is great variation in the size of these hordes, from those containing just a single gold coin to the Yeoti hoard with its 1,118 hones, but the average number of gold coins in these hordes work out to 50.4. To put these figures into perspective, only 12 of the 116 Bahmani hordes contained any gold dinars or tankas, ranging from 1 to 10 coins per hoard, yielding an average of only 3.1 coins per hoard. Granted, each Bahmani gold tanka contains three times as much gold by weight as a home. But even if we convert the number of coins to the amount of gold they represent, that they contain, the results are still quite striking and suggest that the amount of Vijayanagara gold circulating in the Bahmani realm outweighed the amount of Bahmani gold by a factor of at least two to one. Thus, the material and spatial data presented here seem to indicate that there would have been nothing at all unusual about the fiscal arrangements represented by the Maliabad inscription. We may conclude that it was not just that site's location in a contested borderland that determined the Bahmani state's willingness to accept Vijayanagara's currency, but to the contrary, that it reflected broader, pa broader patterns of circulation within the Bahmani territorial sphere, where Bahmani and Vijayanagara currencies were both in <coughs> widespread use. The question, of course, remains, why should this be? What factors might account for this openness to Vijayanagara's currency within the Bahmani realm? A suggestive hint is offered by Farishta in his history, written at the court of Bijapur, one of the important Bahmani successor states, in the opening years of the 17th century. Farishta reports that early in the reign of the Bahmani Sultan Muhammad Shah I, the infidel money changers, or sarafs, of the kingdom began melting down the gold dinars and tankas minted by Muhammad Shah. This they did, claims Farishta, so that they could enable the Vijayanagara Hons and Pratapas to circulate in their stead. Firishta seems to imply here that the gold obtained by melting down Bahmani dinars and tankas was being taken to the Vijayanagara mint to be struck as Hons and their fractions and then put back into circulation in the Bahmani realm. He goes on to suggest that this practice was effectively discouraged for much of the remainder of the Bahmani period until the reign of Mahmud Shah at the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th, when the Bahmani state started to unravel and the Hindu sarafs resumed their old practices. After that, Farishta claims that, quote, within six or seven years, Muslim coinage had completely disappeared and the Hons and Pratapas of Vijayanagara had become current throughout all the Muslim kingdoms. Now, if we step back and look closely at the ex precise expressions employed by Firishta, uh, some of the rhetoric and terminology, we can see that he's invoking a paradigm of religious conflict in accounting for the Hindu Saraf's antagonism of the Bahmanis by casting them as infidels intent on interfering with and subverting the Islamic coinage produced by the Bahmani sultans 
and even going so far as to claim that they had been instigated in this by the intolerant, infidel kings of Vijayanagara. But it would be prudent to consider as well the more explicitly economic or monetary factors that might have contributed to this process. For one thing, we must remember that both in towns, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not ready for that yet, that in both in the towns and in the countryside, the subjects of the Bahmanis were overwhelmingly not Persianate <coughs> immigrants from Delhi or Iran. Um, they were instead local Hindu Deccanese whose ancestors had been living in the region for many centuries. As such, they would have been accustomed to a gold-based currency system such as that employed uh, in the northern Deccan under the Kalyana Chalukyas and their successors, the Yadavas and the Kakatiyas, which hinged on the convenience and versatility of the four Masha Hon and was guaranteed for purity and for weight by the emblems of familiar Hindu deities and the Sanskritic names and titles of an issuing authority. It is not difficult to imagine the mistrust and uneasiness that would have been shown by members of this class when confronted with new coins minted according to a completely unfamiliar metrology with gold denominations that were far too large for their purposes and inscribed with legends in an unfamiliar script that remained illegible even to the most literate among them. While the gold and silver dinars and tankas may have been perfectly sized for paying the generous salaries of the military and religious literary elite, they would not have been well suited at all to the needs of non-elites in the towns and the countryside. It is from this perspective then that the actions of the Deccani Sarafs make the most sense. As a banking community with deep roots in the Deccan, the Sarafs would have been well attuned to the needs and preferences of their primary customers in the towns and the villages. To melt the oversized Bahmani gold coins and remint them as Vijayanagara Hons would have been a natural response and one that was sure to maintain economic equilibrium. In connection with these sarafs, there is another important pattern that emerges from analysis of the spatial database. This has to do with the frequency of co-occurrence of Bahmani and Vijayanagara coins in the same hordes. It is a remarkable point that out of the total of 307 hordes, only 11 of them include coins issued both by the Bahmanis and by Vijayanagara. All of the remaining 296 hordes are perfectly homogeneous, containing either Bahmani coins or Vijayanagara coins, but not both. What this suggests is that even though the Bahmani and Vijayanagara coins circulated side by side in the same districts, they were not generally in use by the same individuals and therefore would not likely have been deposited together in one and the same hoard. In other words, they would have formed parallel currencies circulating within the same geographical region but effectively insulated from each other by virtue of the fact that they generally serviced different social groups and different economic sectors. If we accept this interpretation of parallel currencies, then we need an exploration, uh, I'm sorry, we need an explanation for the above mentioned 11 mixed hordes that contained both Bahmani and Vijayanagara coins. The majority of these coin, uh, hordes, eight out of the 11, contained gold coins of both Bahmani and Vijayanagara issue. These hordes then might plausibly be interpreted as formed by the activities of sarafs who were engaged in money changing between the two gold currencies, and in certain cases might even have been involved in some of the activities described by Farishta, physically transforming Bahmani gold dinars and tankas into Vijayanagara gold hons. As the present map shows, the fine spots of these hordes are not randomly distributed across the study area, but are concentrated in what we might think of as a metropolitan corridor running from Vijayanagara down in the south, right here, uh, up through Bijapur, Gulbarga, Bidar, and all the way on up to Gavalgar uh, in the very northernmost uh, uh, edge of the Bahmani territory. Additionally, just over half of these hordes 
Six of them were found in capital cities, one on the outskirts of Vijayanagara, two in Bijapur, one in Gulbarga, and two in Bidar, while the rest were distributed at various fine spots in between and around these primary urban centers. This spatial patterning would thus seem to suggest that money changing, whether by exchange or by physical transmutation, transformation, was an activity more likely to occur in an urban metropolitan setting than it was in the rural hinterland. Now, what about Farishta's claim that within six or seven years of the end of Mahmud Shah's reign, Muslim coinage had completely disappeared and the Hons and Pratapas of Vijayanagara had become current throughout all the Muslim kingdoms? That this may be essentially an accurate assessment is at least suggested by the coin names that appear in inscriptions of the Bahmanis and their successors. The earliest of the 13 inscriptions that do refer to coin names is the Malayabad inscription with which we began, dating to 1513, and the next is a 1559 inscription from Bijapur. These are the only two inscriptions that represent tankas, that reference tankas, the standard Bahmani silver coin. After that, only Huns are mentioned. These figure in nine of the remaining 11 inscriptions, and a 10th inscription mentions the Varaha, a term which was fully synonymous with the Hun. Thus, Farishta may be a little off in his chronology, since tankas were still appearing in inscriptions in the first half of the 16th century, but fundamentally, the pattern he describes is in fact borne out by the epigraphic evidence that by the second half of the 16th century, the Hons and Pratapas of Vijayanagara had become current throughout all the Muslim kingdoms. In these documented cases, it may be instructive to ask what exactly these Hons were being used for. The inscriptions tell us that they were being used to pay the costs of construction for various architectural projects, civic and royal as well as religious, and they were also used to pay the salaries of various religious functionaries attached to mosques. These are clearly projects and endowments undertaken by the most wealthy and elite members of society, in all cases high-ranking functionaries of the state, some famous individuals, and not by cultivators, grocers, or weavers paying a, a mere hon or two as their annual tax. The projects thus funded included the finishing of a city wall, 6,000 huns, and the construction of an irrigation tank, 50,000 huns, the construction of a royal wardrobe, costing 1,400 huns, and a royal mausoleum, 150,900 huns, and the building of a mosque, 1,000. As for salaries and stipends, these were directed to such mosque functionaries as the muezzin, the carpet spreader, and the lamplighter, among others. This willingness to use these Vijayanagara Hons, even in Islamic religious contexts, their Hindu imagery notwithstanding, points to an attitude of pragmatism and to the recognition that economic considerations could in many cases be taken as more important than religious ones. Now that said, matters do get a little bit more complicated in the last quarter of the 16th century. Two important things had occurred by that date. First, Vijayanagara had essentially collapsed thanks to a decisive military defeat in 1565, and as a result, Huns and their fractions were no longer being minted. This would eventually have led to problems of cash flow for the Bahmani successor states of Ahmadnagar, Bijapur, and Golconda, as the surviving Huns gradually dropped out of circulation, uh, were lost in hordes, and so on. The second development was a natural corollary to the first, and that was that all of these successor states eventually responded to the problem by beginning to mint their own Hons and Fanams. Ahmadnagar was evidently the first to take this step in 1584. Golconda was apparently second, starting at some point during the reign of Muhammad Kuli, 1580 to 1611, and Bijapur was last starting to mint both Huns and Fanams only during the reign of Muhammad Adil Shah. And these are both wonderful specimens that are right here uh, in the ANS collection. Mm -hmm. It is interesting to note I'm, I'm, I want that, that, first of all, none of these successor states ever bothered to mint gold, hon, I'm sorry, gold coins uh, on the larger 
tanka or dinar standards. So they had given up on the what we might think of as Persianate, Islamicate, Sultanate uh, metrology. Uh, and it's also interesting to note that these hons were hons in name, weight, and purity only, and that in other respects they conformed to the norms of Islamic coinage. In other words, from a strictly economic perspective, they might be taken as hons, but in visual terms they did not look at all like the familiar hons. Instead, they were aniconic and carried the Persian legends on each side, consisting of the issuing ruler's name and titles, rather than images of Hindu deities and the name of a Vijayanagara ruler in Devanagari script. Now what may appear to be a little bit counterintuitive is that this lack of icons was actually viewed as a shortcoming for this currency. And this is suggested by some intriguing evidence that shows that surviving older Vijayanagara homes were preferred over the newer locally <coughs> minted ones. The newly minted hons, which are called Padshahi hon in Persian, and they even occur in Sanskrit as Suratraniya Varaha, they were evidently not fully trusted by users, and as a result, the old genuine hons, or kara hons, were preferred and exchanged at a premium. One of the above mentioned inscriptions from Qutb Shahi Hyderabad in 1674 specified that an annual grant for the upkeep of a mosque was to be made not with any horns, but with genuine horns, with kara horns. And um, um, the horns that looked like horns, as opposed to, you know, like, like Islamic horns. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those deities were there in the images, and that was, a, in effect, a, a guarantee of the authenticity and the value of the coin, even for Muslim uh, uh, users. So uh, even more telling is a bit of evidence provided by a royal decree, a forman, issued by the Adil Shahi governor of the province of Sholapur in 1654. That is, right at the time that the Adil Shahis were first introducing their, uh, their, uh, their own homes. The forman reads in uh, translation, at present it has come to our notice Ten. Okay, I couldn't see the one. That's much <laughs> better than a zero. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I just got extra, uh, extra, extra. A stay of a stay of my execution here. Okay. So at present, it has come to our notice that the bankers, merchants, the subjects, and others residing in villages, towns, and marketplaces, included in the district of Sholapur, refuse to accept homes bearing our name stamp, Muhammad Shah. Do not exchange it for the coins of smaller denominations, and do not use it for sale and purchase. What a boldness it is, since it bears our name stamp. Now we order that as the hons consist of gold of 43 ayars or kas, as it is called in the language of the Deccan, which works out to 82.69 fineness, so it was even imitating the somewhat more uh, lower uh, gold rate uh, that was characteristic of the Janagara Hans as opposed to 100% purity uh, that was very closely realized uh, by the, the Bahmani coins. Whoever so deems it to be counterfeit refuses to accept it after deforming the same and postpones to exchange it for coins of smaller denominations, should be chastised in an exemplary manner, and his movable and immovable property should be confiscated. I think we have to conclude that if Muhammad Shah had perhaps ordered his horns struck with his name in Devanagari script instead of in Persian, and had put images of a Hindu deity or two on the obverse, the residents of the villages, towns, and marketplaces would have been more willing to accept them. And I've got to say at this point that that's exactly what the Gurids were doing in North India. So let, let me now step back from the details of this narrative in order to draw some broader conclusions. I would like to make three observations. The first relates to the enormous staying power of the Hon. Here we have considered the Hon primarily as a Vijayanagara coin, but it also has a pre-Vijayanagara history going back to the 10th century during the rule of the Chalukyas of Kalyana, and a post-Vijayanagara history coming down to the age of European colonialism, with the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the English all minting Hons, which they called pagodas, the English continuing to mint them all the way down to the opening years of the 19th century. 
Indeed, it would seem that at one time or another, almost every state or minor principality in the Deccan struck Hons and or Fanams, and that they circulated widely, moving well beyond their place of minting. For example, we know from a currency exchange rate table that has been fortuitously preserved from Aurangabad, dated 1651, and thus to the period immediately after the Mughal occupation of the northern Deccan, and the seat of the Mughals in the Deccan, that as many as 27 different kinds of Hons could be expected to show up in the main market at Aurangabad. Eight of these were Vijayanagara issues of different rulers from Hariharaya II, 1377 to 1404, to Sri Rangaraya, 1572 to 1586, and the others came from places as far apart as Chaul on the western Deccan coast, and Jinji and Mylapur in the Tamil coastal plain to the southeast. The Hon's staying power can be seen not only in its being continuously minted over a period of nearly a thousand years, but also in its persistence in circulating. Thus, the exchange rate table just mentioned suggests that Hariharaya's coins, minted at the end of the 14th century, could still be expected to show up regularly in Aurangabad's market some 250 years later. Even more impressive is a hoard from Sovinahalli in Balari district, close to the Vijayanagara capital, which included among its 22 coins, one copper coin each of Krishna Raja Wodeyar, 1799-1868, the British East India Company into the 19th century, and then King George V, reigning from 1911 to 1936, and 19 Vijayanagara gold horns, <coughs> suggesting that these coins remained salient, even if not actually circulating, even well on into the early 20th century. I'd like to suggest that the key to the staying power of the Hun would appear to have been its small size and its four fractional denominations, which facilitated a wide range of economic transactions, from paying for luxuries to purchasing more uh, inexpensive foodstuffs, thus serving not only the elite, but also members of the more humble classes. As a denomination set, the Hon and its fractions appears to have been perfectly adapted to a full range of social uses. My second observation is that the only prominent states in the Deccan that did not issue Hons were the Bahmani Sultanate and its immediate precursor, the Delhi Sultanate. Under the Khaljis and Tughlaqs, the Delhi Sultanate had annexed the northern portions of the Deccan and imposed its own alien monetary system on the region, one that was based not on local precedent, but rather on a system developed in northern India. In fact, early forms of Hons minted by the Yadavas, Kakatiyas, and Hoysalas would have been in circulation at the time of Delhi's conquest of these territories, but they were largely appropriated as tribute and taken back to Delhi, where Amir Khosrau tells us great quantities of Yadava Hons were shot out of trebuchets as largesse distributed to the residents of the capital. Others may have been melted down and their gold used to mint the new gold dinars and tankas of the Sultanate's coinage system. By the time the early Bahmanis rebelled from Delhi and established their own independent Sultanate, there would have been little coinage left that was minted to the older indigenous Deccani standard. But because there was ample production of such coins right across the river in the neighboring state of Vijayanagara, significant quantities of these coins would have begun flowing into the Bahmani kingdom to meet the continuing local demand for smaller gold, uh, a smaller gold unit. With tax agreements such as that documented at Maliabad, Hons would have begun flowing into the Bahmani treasury as well. In a very real sense then, there was no reason why the Bahmanis should have felt it necessary to mint Hons. The Vijayanagara Hons would have filled the need for them perfectly well. An added bonus might have been that they were potentially even understood as signs of tribute offered by the neighboring state. As we have seen, however, everything changed when Vijayanagara fell in 1565, and the source of these pivotally important coins quickly disappeared, leaving the Bahmani successor states to improvise their own varied solutions. My third and final observation is one that follows directly from the first two, and that is that we cannot even begin to understand Bahmani monetary history if we think of it only from the perspective of the currency that the state produced. Once coinage has been put into circulation and entered the market, users will inevitably make use of it in ways 
different from what the state itself had intended or anticipated. Nor will users hesitate to employ the coinage issued by other states if that better serves their purposes, or even, as we have seen, to melt down coins of one type in order to convert them into a more desirable and usable denomination. In short, it is crucial that we move beyond a knowledge of production alone and that we consider as well the record of circulation and monetary adaptation that is written into the material and spatial record of the coin hoards, a task that is much easier with GIS and other statistical methods. Once we do this, we can better see that the Deccan in fact constitutes a single integrated currency zone and that despite the fundamental differences between the Bahmani and Vijayanagara currency systems, they nonetheless interacted significantly and creatively with each other. Sometimes, as in the case presented here, it was the Bahmani currency system that was on the receiving end, while at other times, as in the case of adopting an expanded range of copper denominations, it was Vijayanagara. But that is a story for another day. <laughs>